The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, thrown in jail on trumped up charges. The pastor accused of being a terrorist. Andrew Brunson looks back at his 18 months inside a Turkish prison. Plus, a blazing inferno. The whole flame just enveloped my whole body. And a former SEAL medic is rushed to the ICU. It was kind of a shock to see how extensive the burns were. How he emerged from the flames. God answers prayers. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. The heat is on the president's to f uh, about withdrawing U.S. troops from Syria. Still, the president doubles down on his decision. Will Vice President be able to broker a deal with Turkish leaders to cease fire? And if not, how many thousands will die? Jenna Browder, Browder brings us this report. Vice President Mike Pence and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo will meet with Turkish leaders today to try to broker a deal. The Turkish president backtracking on a statement he made earlier that he wouldn't meet with them. The VP and secretary arriving early this morning and heading straight to the presidential palace for meetings with Erdogan. Meanwhile, President Trump is standing by his decision to pull U.S. troops out of Syria. Turkey is taking land from Syria. Syria is not happy about it. Let them work it out. The president also tweeting pictures from a White House meeting, writing, do you think they like me? Top Democrats eventually walking out of that meeting, charging the president with insulting the speaker. What we witnessed on the part of the yeah. president was a meltdown. Sad to say. I see a pattern of behavior with uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi. She storms out of another meeting trying to make it unproductive. The other Democrats stayed and actually had a very productive meeting. Pelosi said Trump was shaken by this earlier vote in the House. On this vote, the yeas are 354, the nays are 60. House Democrats and Republicans voting to condemn the president's decision. The move cleared the way for Turkey to attack the Kurds, former U.S. allies in the fight against terrorism. Today, Senators Lindsey Graham and Chris Van Hollen are expected to introduce bipartisan sanctions against Turkey. Graham, one of President Trump's closest allies, had tough words for Trump on Wednesday's 700 Club. I am looking to President Trump to change this. I will do anything I can to help him, but I will also become President Trump's worst nightmare. I will not sit alone on the sidelines and watch a good ally, the Kurds, be slaughtered by Turkey and watch Iran move into uh, Syria and become another nightmare uh, for Israel. This is a defining moment for President Trump. He needs to up his game. Lindsey Graham would like to stay in the Middle East for the next thousand years. On the ground, the Kurds claim Turkish forces are using banned chemical weapons like napalm and white phosphorus. Meanwhile, more than 100,000 refugees need help. CBN's Operation Blessing is working with the Barzani Charity Foundation to provide relief, including thousands of boxes of food, cases of water, blankets, baby formula, and hygiene kits. Also late Wednesday, President Trump released a letter he sent to President Erdogan last week. It reads in part, Let's work out a deal. You don't want to be responsible for slaughtering thousands of people, and I don't want to be responsible for destroying the Turkish economy. And I will. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you about what's happening. We're sending 317 metric tons of aid to the Syrian Kurdish refugees as part of the uh, Barzani Charitable Foundation. Uh, the uh, 5,000 boxes of food, 10,000 cases of water, 20,000 blankets, 5,000 hygiene kits, and cartons of baby formula. If you want to help us, it's called, now called OB Refugee. Uh, it's 71777 to give. You can text that or Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. We want to help those people who are suffering. Uh, we didn't ask for it, but uh, that's the way it is. Now, CBN Capitol Hill correspondent Abigail Robertson joins us more. Uh, Lindsey Graham is uh, introducing sanctions against Turkey. Uh, how strong are they, and has he got support in Congress for it? 
Well, we're going to see Senator Graham is introducing those sanctions alongside Democrat Senator Chris Van Hollens later this afternoon. He says that they're going to target President Erdogan and his family. They're going to target Turkish banks, Turkey's energy sector, where they get their money from. They really want to hit the Turkish economy with these sanctions and really send a message that the U.S. is not going to stand by why Turkey slaughters a U.S. ally, the Kurds. Uh, do the people you talk to think this is enough to stop Erdogan? Mm. Well, I think there's a lot of skepticism here on the Hill. And this is really, there's strong bipartisan support to do something. But I think lawmakers are, are putting their heads together and really figuring out what they can do right now. I spoke with Senator Marco Rubio yesterday, and he says he supports the sanctions, but he's worried that it's really not going to do enough. He actually told me that he worries that this could help President Erdogan on the ground in Turkey. But right now, it, it seems like the only response lawmakers really really feel like they have right now, but they definitely feel like they have limited options. I mean, what do you hear about that meeting in the White House? Did the president melt down or is that an uh, overstatement by the uh, Democrats? Well, what we're hearing is that it was a very tense meeting. This meeting came right after the, the House overwhelmingly passed a resolution condemning the president, president Trump's ab, a, actions of taking those troops out of northern Syria. And this had leadership from both the House and Senate on both sides of the aisle. But this really is the first time that Republicans have strongly opposed something that President Trump has done. So in this meeting was House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, Minority Whip Steve Scalise, both of whom voted with Democrats against President Trump's actions. So we hear that there were some harsh words exchanged between Speaker Nancy Pelosi and President Trump that caused Democrat leadership to walk out of the meeting. But we, we've heard from Whip Scalise and others that the meeting continued. And, and Whip Scalise says it actually was a pretty productive meeting. There were a few Democrats still in the room. So after that whole incident in the beginning, that it actually was a pretty productive meeting in the end. So we'll We'll see what comes from that. <laughs> Thank you. Abigail Robertson. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have been advocating on this program and in private that the president should have a Trump declaration, just like the Balfour Declaration, that declared a homeland for the Kurds. There are 36 million of them, and they have no homeland. And uh, he just doesn't like the Kurds. And he's paying the price for it. Uh, there have been our strong allies. The Peshmerga have fought alongside us uh, against ISIS. They've done our bidding, and there have been our strong allies. And then all of a sudden, it seems like we've abandoned them. Well, uh, he's paying the price for that. And it's a very severe price that may well carry through to the 2020 election. We'll see. Well, in other news, uh, Democratic Representative Elijah Cummins passed away earlier this morning. John Jessup, Jessup has more on that. <laughs> that is right, Pat. The Maryland Democrat died to complications from longstanding health challenges. His congressional office said he was 68. Cummings served in the House for 23 years as chairman of the House Oversight and Reform Committee. He led investigations into President Trump's business dealings. His widow, Maya, said in a statement that he was an honorable man who proudly served his district and the nation with dignity, integrity, compassion, and humility. Well, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is preparing Republican senators for an impeachment trial as soon as Thanksgiving. The Washington Post reports McConnell used the GOP's weekly meeting Wednesday to explain the impeachment process and take questions along with Senate Judiciary Chairman Lindsey Graham, who was a manager for President Bill Clinton's impeachment trial back in 1998. If the House passes formal articles of impeachment, the trial moves to the Senate, where, Pat, it could run from after Thanksgiving to the Christmas break. Uh, the political fallout for the Democrats is going to be enormous because this is going to take all of the uh, steam away from whatever initiatives they may have that's going to focus 100 percent on impeachment. And in the last impeachment, what happened? The person who was leading the impeachment, uh, Newt Gingrich, lost his seat uh, as speaker. And the person who was impeached, Bill Clinton, got another term. So. In my opinion, this impeachment uh, is going to divert the Democrats from whatever they have in mind doing. Maybe they want to do that. I don't know. But uh, politically, it's suicide. And they have 
assiduously avoided having a vote. And the House cannot bring forth articles of impeachment unless the House votes on it. It's got to be the whole House. It cannot be the Speaker. It certainly cannot be Adam Schiff. And if they don't have a vote, then of course, again, they can't be demanding uh, witnesses and subpoena documents and all the rest of it. They can't do it. So they've got to have a vote. And, and it looks like we're coming down to that. And now we're talking about, and it goes to as a trial to the Senate. The Senate is now in, in a trial mode. And the president, he'd better be nice to Lindsey Graham. John. Pat, a nor'easter turned deadly, bringing powerful winds and heavy rains to parts of the northeast. Outside Philadelphia, conditions were so bad that a van lost control on the highway, flipping over and killing three people. The storm brought blinding rain and wind gusts up to 70 miles an hour. Hundreds of thousands of homes and businesses are without power, and it caused flooding in streets and created impossible travel conditions for commuters from New York to New Jersey and Boston. Meteorologists say the storm could see a drastic drop in pressure, potentially becoming an ugly event known as a bomb cyclone. Pat, back to you. Well, uh, we're having some rain here, but nothing like that. It's, it's north of where we live, and so we've been spared, but it sounds terrible. A bomb cyclone with dangerous winds and uh, crushing uh, the temperature change. Yeah, we have had some unbelievable weather this it's crazy, year and big weather patterns yeah. you know, that well, just seem to be hitting everywhere. I'm sure people will say it's all on account of uh, Global fossil warming. fuels. <laughs> we'll stop driving cars and having flatulent cows. Terry. <laughs> Well, still ahead on today's program, a blazing inferno and a Navy SEAL engulfed in the flames. How in the world did he survive? Plus, God's hostage, the pastor who survived two years inside a Turkish prison. Andrew Brunson joins us live. What did he suffer behind bars? And then, striking out slavery, how baseball's Albert Pujols is wielding his platform to smite sex trafficking. All coming up. Accused of being a CIA spy, Andrew Brunson was locked up in a Turkish prison for two years. The plight of this missionary attracted worldwide attention and made him a political pawn in a power struggle between the U.S. and Turkey. Take a look. Turkish police arrested the North Carolina pastor in October 2016, three months after a failed coup attempt against Turkey President Erdogan. The Brunsons served there for more than 20 years, where they established Izmir Resurrection Church. They openly shared Christ and also helped Syrian refugees, some of them Kurds. For that, the Turkish government accused Brunson of being a CIA agent, plotting with Kurdish terrorists to carry out the attempted coup. Initially, the Turkish government said it would free Brunson if the United States would send the accused coup leader, Fatullah Gulen, back to Turkey. Fearing Gulen would be killed, President Trump refused the exchange, so Brunson remained incarcerated. Meanwhile, Christians around the world were praying and working for Brunson's release and his safe return to the United States. With the help of the Trump administration, that happened on October 12, 2018. Brunson writes about his ordeal in a new book, God's Hostage, A True Story of Persecution, Imprisonment, and Perseverance. It's an incredible book, ladies and gentlemen, God's Hostage, A True Story of Persecution, Imprisonment, and Perseverance. And Andrew Brunson and his wife, Noreen, are joining us now. Pastor, you're a man of great faith and courage. Tell me why they came after you the first time. Why did you get arrested? I think uh, there are two sides to this. There are two right. stories, and one is man's story. And I think they arrested us first to deport us, right. but then someone decided to keep us and make us an, make an example of us. And I think they intended to intimidate other missionaries, have them self-deport, and also intimidate local believers, local Turkish Christians. And then someone decided to keep us and use us uh, to, as a bargaining chip with the U.S. Well, you were in Turkey for, what, about 18 years, and you spoke the language fluently, and, and you loved the Turkish people, and you, you were a pastor to them. Who, who, who is this 
gull in, in the northwest of America that they are so concerned about? They thought you were one of his agents. Well, they just, uh, there's someone who leads a, a, an Islamic movement, and he used to work with Erdogan, but they had a falling out. So there, there are reasons on the human side why this was happening, but then there's a second story behind all the political intrigue that's God's story. And I think God was using uh, my imprisonment. Actually, he raised up a worldwide prayer movement, this, an unprecedented prayer movement focused on one person that was pouring prayer into Turkey, and that's going to transform the country. You think, oh, could there be? You know, Turkey is the country, and when you look at the churches of Asia and Revelation, it was all in Turkey. Turkey was the center of the Christian church in those yes. days. And, uh, how far have they gone away from their founding principles? Uh, you know, the Ataturk was set up a, essentially a democratic form of government. Now they, they have become a, what is it, a theocracy? I mean, well, Turkey is the largest unevangelized country in the world. Yeah. Most cities in Turkey do not have a single church. And over the last 20 years, especially under President Erdogan, uh, it has become more and more Islamist. But the, the other side of the story is that, that more and more Turks are coming into churches now and saying, I don't want to be a Muslim anymore. Mm -hmm. So there's a reaction also. There is oppression, but there's a reaction coming to this. And God told us before that there was going to be a great harvest in Turkey. We believe there will be a great, powerful move of God. But he also showed us that it would come in difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm. So these, this oppression is creating the circumstances for many people to begin to ask questions that they never would have before. Do you want to go back? We would like to go back someday. <laughs> I think we will someday. I believe we will someday. We, we can't go you? back right now. Yeah, you yeah. can't. Okay. No. Well, let me, what did you think when your husband was seized and put in prison. What went through your mind? Well, we were both seized and put and locked up for a little oh, while. You, you were locked yes, up too. Yes, and then they let me go unexpectedly. Yeah. Uh, and kept him for another two years. So it was definitely, it was a surprise to be, um, well, arrested for deportation, but then kept. That was very unusual. Uh, that just doesn't happen. So we felt that we were in uncharted territory. We didn't know what was coming. Well, it looked like the death sentence. I mean, the, those crimes that they were charging had carried with them the death penalty, didn't Well, it? basically, they had uh, three life sentences in solitary confinement is what they wanted. And so that's like a death penalty. It means withering away the rest of my life in a Turkish jail. Were you contemplating suicide or wondering if the Lord might not take you out of there? Well, I... I I did break, and this is one of the things uh, about the book, is so many biographies I read there of Christian heroes who are my heroes, uh, they, they show very strong people who go through difficulties and they, they persevere. When I went into prison, I thought that I would feel strength and joy and even in difficulty, uh, the, the presence of God, and I, I didn't, and I was really surprised at this, and I really broke. Uh, a number of times, and yes, I, I was suicidal, but the story is that God started to rebuild me, mm. and, I, and He brought me out of that, those very dark places. So it ended on a good note. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, yes. Yes. but uh, you were being tried, and I understand the judge wouldn't permit you to put certain witnesses on because he said they've already heard that. Oh, it was, it was very much a kangaroo court. It was a show trial, and I knew that whatever judicial process was followed and whatever decision they made, in the end, it was a political decision. Uh, was, the, was Erdogan himself involved? Is he aware of what was happening? You think, were you somehow a pawn in his plan? Uh, yes, and from, from the second month on, third month on, he was involved and he was the one who made decisions. So the title of the book is God's Hostage. In a sense, I was Erdogan's hostage. Yeah. He was keeping me, but only until God had completed what he wanted to through my imprisonment. I came to see that my imprisonment was an assignment from God. So Erdogan imprisoned me and he kept me there, but God was very much involved in what Erdogan intended to harm me God turned around and brought a tremendous amount of good out of it. Uh, was there any torture in the prison? Was it deprivation of food or anything like that? Not for me. Not for you? Uh, there are people who have suffered there. Uh, some cellmates I had uh, told me of things. Uh, 
For me, uh, it was psychological uh, torture, I would say. Being in solitary confinement, uh, in isolation, was very, very difficult for me. Well, were you aware that people all around the world were pray? You, you, you know, the, uh, I'm president of the American Center for Law and Justice, and, and they took you on as a special project, and they were fought in the courts for they you. They did, yes. We're so grateful for what they did. Well, people all over the world, over the country and the world were praying for you. Did you, were you aware of that, both of you? Did you know that? We became increasingly aware. Uh -huh. And whatever I would receive, I would pass on to him for his encouragement. In fact, that was something that he asked me every single time. Are people still praying? And I said, yes, they're still praying. And it seems to be growing. And I would name off the countries, in fact, that prayer was coming from. It's really amazing because it spread all over the world. Yes. And there were millions of people who became involved. So it was... This prayer was for much more than getting me out. God was doing something much bigger with it. Well, it's, obviously he is because you've become a celebrity. Well, <laughs> the President of the United States took you on as a special project. Did, did he met your plane when you, when you got home? Uh, no, uh, we arrived and our children met our plane. That oh, was very moving for us okay. at Andrews Air Force Base. And then we went to the White House. But I think what a roller coaster. The day before, I'm standing in a Turkish court and they convicted me as a terrorist. And I thought, they're sending me back to prison. Then suddenly they said, we're releasing you for time served and you can leave the country. So I went from being convicted as a terrorist, 24 hours later, we're in the White House. Well, they, they, uh, the United States put sanctions. Uh, Trump put sanctions on, on Erdogan, and he, he, he knew that, did he? He, uh, he took unprecedented steps. What I understand is that uh, there have been other hostage situations. Presidents don't usually get involved directly, mm -hmm. uh, but he a number of times uh, made phone calls to Erdogan and, and really pressed him. And the steps to impose sanctions were unprecedented at the time. So we think that what was behind this, what was driving yeah. all of this was the prayer. Prayer. That's what brought yeah. it up to this kind of a level. Yeah. There's no question. Well, what did you do all the time he's in prison? How, how did you survive? Yeah. Uh, I had to press into the Lord. I had no option but yeah. to do that and uh, really lean into him and really try to be claiming our, the prophetic words that we'd had uh, through the years and say, you know, I'm standing on this. Yes. Uh, because in, in cases of persecution, there are no guarantees. Yeah. There's no outcome that is guaranteed. And so then... What, uh, There's no Bible verse that says Andrew will get out of prison. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yes. I haven't read one recently. Yes. And so this is what I've tried to explain to people, that that's where the word of the Lord that is for our situation, the here and now word of the Lord, that's what you stand on. Probably in your book... You prayed for people to get healed in Turkey, and, and the Lord healed certain ones. Oh, we, we, saw, we saw a lot happening. Did you? Oh, yes. And many, what especially touches me is that about 80% of the Muslims we prayed for had some encounter with Jesus, mm -hmm. some sense of his presence, some, something that was tangible that they could feel, sense. That's, I mean, that's really something. So the Lord is there, and we're, we're just yeah. working in supernatural ways and giving people dreams. I mean, He is moving in the Middle East. They're seeing. Well, we we've had re reports of those who have met this white figure, and he's, he's Jesus. All the time. All the time. All the time. Yes. Almost every Muslim that we know who's come to the Lord in Turkey, almost all of them have had a dream. Uh, really? Yes. What do you think? I mean, you know, uh, going back to the, the Ottoman Empire was breaking up, and a, a guy named Ataturk starts this new thing, and they call him the Young Turks. So we talk about the Young Turks. And, and Turkey was the, was the home, really, of those churches in Asia that uh, you find in Revelation. And you were in Izmir, Turkey. Uh, yes. That's the old Smyrna, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, was there any prophetic significance that the people feel in any way connected to the Bible because of that? You know, I think that because Turkey was the head of the Ottoman Empire, yeah. they were the head of the Muslim world for centuries. So they spread Islam by the sword, and they also uh, suffocated Christianity wherever they went. Yes. So there is this uh, dark inheritance that has come. Mm -hmm. But what God was doing was raising up his sons and daughters around the world by using me as a magnet yes. for prayer to confront that. And so I think that all this prayer pouring into Turkey is going to uh, change the spiritual atmosphere, is going to open that key so that there's much more freedom that comes 
spiritually. And when that happens, all the countries around it will be affected as well. That, that, that could actually bring revival to the whole Muslim world then, right? That's, that's why I think that God chose to focus prayer on Turkey. He could have chosen Egypt or Jordan or sure. Syria, but for some reason he chose Turkey because I think it's a, it's a spiritual key to the region. Well, I mean, when you think of the fact that this is the fountainhead of Christianity, that the churches of Asia were all located in Turkey, and suddenly, I mean, the Gog and Magog stuff, even in Re Revelation, that's Turkey. I mean, it's all Turkey. And uh, if there's a revival coming out of that, it, it, I mean, God goes back to the um, origin, and then He works out from there. So you, you, you are <laughs> Exhibit A for, for God's move. When do you think that's going to happen so that you could get back over there, by the way? I, in 2009, the Lord spoke to me and said, prepare for harvest. Yeah. When I went into prison, I thought that had been, assignment had been canceled, but I found that my imprisonment was actually part of that assignment. All this prayer is preparing for harvest. Now, I think that God raised up all this prayer because there's going to be a powerful move very soon. And what Erdogan is doing, there's, there are difficult times in Turkey, but many Turks are asking questions that they never asked before. Hmm. Well, I, I just... Pray with you that it'll happen, and God bless you. Well, what are you doing? Are you traveling around speaking? Is that is that uh, you have a church or anything now? Right now, I'm asking God for our next assignment. <laughs> okay. And it, we we really have the Muslim world in our hearts. So we want to see a yeah. a new generation of of church planters go into the Muslim world. Well, I pray that. And thank you most for being here. You're very courageous and. I'm glad you didn't have to commit suicide. I You're too. still alive. <laughs> I am too. The book, is, ladies and gentlemen, is called God's Hostage. Amazing. It's available wherever books are sold. A man of faith and courage and uh, extraordinary. So pray with him that there might be a revival in the Muslim world and that it might start in Turkey because that's where the churches of Asia. And he was in Izmir, which is the old Smyrna. God bless you both. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you both. Well, Terry, what's next? Well, coming up, Andrew Pujols is one of the premier sluggers of his generation. So why does he want to be remembered as something more? And then, burned alive, this former seal had skin dangling from his arms and legs. How did he survive his searing brush with death? Find out. It's all later on today's show. History in action. That's exactly what baseball fans see every time Albert Pujols steps up to the plate. And those in the stands get to see something more, Pujols' real passion. CBN's Tom Buring caught up with the living legend and his wife, Dee Dee, to see exactly how they're striking out slavery. Below the halo top at Angel Stadium is a baseball hall of famer in waiting. While Albert Pujols' hitting milestones ascend, so does his conviction to go to bat for those trafficked and enslaved. Albert and his wife Dee Dee are founding ambassadors to strike out slavery with pre and post game events, informing those unaware of the plight and reassuring those who are affected by it. Baseball is, is our platform. It's 162 games a year, packing millions of people in 30 stadiums across our country. That is an enormous platform. Being able to bring strikeout slavery into these ballparks brings local organizations and national organizations into these cities to allow fans to interact with getting involved. Albert and Dee, Dee are willing to use their voices to do an event like this is so encouraging and empowering to all of us who, have, who are survivors. It's an issue that people don't want to look at. They want to keep it at a distance. What makes it personal for you? It can happen to any of our kids. So I know people don't want to deal with it, but that is the problem that, you know, there is a issues and we need to deal with it. I have five kids myself, you know, so I need to educate my kids, you know, as a leader of my house to make sure I raise in the right way. And a lot of people think that it's just happening out in another country. It happens in our backyard. Major League Baseball, DD is a big, big business. Easy or difficult getting their support for events like this? Um, gradual. 
I realized that they didn't know much about it. Organ trafficking, labor trafficking, sex trafficking, there's like 27 different types of trafficking. Nobody likes any of it. So we came back here to the Angels, we brought all those organizations, and we just asked for permission to be able to do this event. We're giving you an experience to learn about human trafficking, help educate the community, but do it in a very tasteful, palatable way, but in a powerful way. How do we size up that opponent of trafficking? The issue, not just domestically, but globally, is so enormous and very hidden. So it's almost impossible to actually get the full scope of this atrocity. We're in a place with what we know to position ourselves to fight back through prevention and education. Whether there's 45 million or 27 million people caught in this, if one person's caught in it, everyone has work to do. Baseball players can quickly be reduced to a statistic in a uniform, mm -hmm. a commodity of sorts. Mm -hmm. Victims of trafficking can also become these faceless numbers. Tell me about the value yeah. of people. I know that it's not about me. It's about more than baseball. It's about reaching to others and making the impact in the community. It's great to be able to accomplish what I have accomplished in the game, but I don't want people to remember me as one of the best baseball players. I want people to remember as one of the person that walk and fear the Lord, and I want to be able, you know, to help or into other that love that he gave me every day. So, Didi, with the messaging, what is the one thing that they rally to most? People are pumped that they get to have this experience here and that they have professional athletes getting behind the cause and standing with all of the organizations and the survivor advocates and with the community about serious things. This is something that can be stopped. This is something that can be helped. It's going to take educating the masses to put an end to this. What message does this audience need to hear? That trafficking and exploitation exists, and it exists right here. Like, hit people with the truth because it's gonna break chains. We can't fix what we don't face, and we can't face what we don't see. There's nothing like being free. What are you finding that players are rising to in this challenge that want to participate? Players getting educated like myself, you know, because there's a lot of players that run the league that don't even know anything about it. And I think that's, that's the message that we want to send. You know, we want to be able to educate the players, but we also want to be able to educate the, the, the fans, you know. But what about the core of the constant issue? Unless that's broken, it's just going to keep cycling. We live in a fallen world. You are talking about an issue in the area of perversion. And I truly believe that the devil lives and owns that space. A really big underbelly, a deep, deep root, the demand. When you have a nation that has exposure to the level of pornography that we do, this is a much bigger conversation. We really are just treating symptoms. Shedding light on this issue, deliverance, restoration. Those terms look different to you now? I, I know there was a day when I was lost because I didn't know who I was and I lived extremely reckless. But when I found my identity in Christ, the whole narrative changed. So I feel like it's our job that every person I walk in front of who has an eternal existence to give them what I know. Albert, you already have secured a historic Hall of Fame career. How would you advise others as to how a legend should live their life? To be a leader, you don't have to have big numbers. You don't have to be the best player. You just need to be able to, to use the talent that God has given you and to be vocal and be open to, to talk and to get involved. What I have learned over my 19, 20 years of working with Christ is to be able to use the opportunity that He has given you to impact others for the kingdom and the glory of God. Thank you, Albert Pujols and Didi Pujols and all who work with you for what you're doing to make a difference in this area of sex trafficking. It is a dark underbelly. It's not just in other parts of the world. It's right here in the United States, and you and I can make a difference. And I know God has really burdened your heart with Absolutely. that, Pat, as well. It's horrible. It really is. What's being done to these women is 
and a million a year. Yeah. And children. Children, and especially children young boys, as well. young girls. Yeah. It's terrible. As well. Right. So we thank the Pujols for that. Well, still ahead, this special ops medic has survived some of the most dangerous places on Earth. So how did he almost die in his own backyard? And more importantly, what saved his life? Plus, we've got your email. A viewer says, is it okay for me to write in my Bible? We have your questions and some honest answers. It's all coming up later. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. A breakthrough in Brexit negotiations, the United Kingdom's plan to leave the European Union. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson and the leader of the European Commission both said they've reached an agreement. Johnson is heading to Brussels for a two-day summit to finalize the deal. He still faces a tough task getting it through Parliament. Opponents say they'll work to block the deal. Johnson promised to take the United Kingdom out of the EU bloc by October 31st with or without an agreement. Well, major drug companies are working to settle thousands of claims against them related to the nation's opioid crisis, hoping to avoid trial. They're negotiating with state attorneys general as jury selection for the first federal trial over the overdose epidemic is set to begin Monday. According to one source, the settlement would be worth tens of billions of dollars and include drug makers like Johnson & Johnson and Teva. Opioid overdoses have claimed more than 400,000 American lives in the past two decades. You can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Kohlberg is a retired Navy SEAL special ops medic. He's traveled to the most dangerous parts of the world, been shot at, and under imminent attack. So in his wildest dreams, Fred never imagined that he would almost die in his own backyard. Finished working out and had a big wood pile that needed to get uh, burnt down. I uh, used some accelerant, which was gasoline, which was a huge mistake. When I lit it, a gust of wind came up at that opportune time and... I mean, it happened instantaneously. The whole flame just enveloped my whole body. Training and instinct told Fred Kohlberg to drop and roll. His clothes didn't catch fire, but the retired Navy SEAL medic knew it was bad. And I saw my skin hanging from both my arms and my legs. The only thing that was on my mind at that moment was, I got to get to the hospital. Fred stumbled to his house and called his wife, Julie, who was at their farm 10 minutes away. When I got up to the house, I was looking around. I was ready to drive out to the field to where the big fire was burning. And then he walked out of the house. And I was like, whoa, OK, <laughs> he's really burnt. They wrapped his burns before starting out for the hospital in nearby Petersburg, Virginia. The pain was so excruciating. It was focused on getting to the hospital safely and getting into the emergency room for the docs to start working. Not equipped to treat burns of that severity, doctors gave orders to have Fred airlift into the Virginia Commonwealth University Burn Center in Richmond. After watching her husband loaded into the helicopter, Julie started to pray. I was mainly just praying that you'd be okay. At VCU, okay. Fred, who was still conscious, was taken to the ICU in critical condition, with second and third degree burns on 22% of his body. Assessing the extent of my burns and more IV lines in, getting a camera down my throat to make sure I had no inhalation injury. It was kind of a shock to see how much, how extensive the burns were. Doctor's main concern was loss of circulation at the burn sites, especially in his right arm. Lack of blood flow could cause kidney failure, which could lead to death. I was just afraid he was gonna die. I knew God was there, but um, I was just praying the whole time he'd be okay. Amazingly, Fred's lungs and airway were unharmed by the fireball. 
and after 48 hours in the ICU, circulation in his body had much improved. The first few days, the wounds looked really good. And it was looking so good that they were telling me that he would probably be going home and like the end of the week. Fred's return home, however, would be delayed. The burned tissue on his arms and legs became infected. Medical staff had to scrub and treat the underlying skin constantly. It didn't matter how much they scrubbed. They couldn't scrub hard enough. They couldn't get deep enough. It just kept them getting you know, worse and worse and worse. The infection was so deep that doctors decided to cut out the infected tissue. Friends from church joined Julie in prayer. They actually came up and prayed with him before going into surgery as well. The support, it's really hard to put into words. So awesome and so uplifting. Doctors had to operate twice to remove all the infection. Once completed, they immediately started the long, painful process of skin grafting. Fred was simply grateful to be alive. It was really hard for me to accept that I almost died until I actually realized how close I was. I could have died right in my backyard, and Julie wouldn't have known, you know, probably for hours. And that's the whole reason for this right here is to let everybody know that God answers prayers and he wants to heal. By all reports, Fred's body healed more quickly than expected. A week and a half after his last skin graft, he was cleared to return home. They said it could be two to three months in the hospital. And we found out that that following week that they were going to discharge me. After a month of physical therapy, Fred was released to go back to work at his premier medical trauma and tactical training company. And here we're thinking that, okay, I'm gonna be out of work for six months to a year. What are we going to do? There's another miracle that God performed. When he's not at work, Fred spends a lot of time with Julie working on their farm. While his wounds have healed, the scars are a reminder of God's faithfulness and the prayers that brought them through. Prayer can be so powerful because it can give you such a peace you know, when you need it, um, strength when you need it, to help you through situations when you need it. John 14, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Prayer does change things, and prayer sustains us in the middle of our need, and it unites us as God's kids. You know, it's, it's really powerful, and so we want to pray for you today. Yeah, what do you got? I've it's got a answers, prayer, answer yeah. to prayer from Browns Mill, New Jersey. Pat, this is Lily, and she has a daughter, Bonnie, who had a tumor pressing on her brain. Surgery was scheduled as the family continued to pray for healing. On the day of the surgery, Pat, you gave a word of knowledge, and you said someone is praying, and there's a large tumor pressing on the brain, causing problems. God says he's got it. Well, that's exactly what happened. The doctor confirmed the tumor is gone and the family is giving the glory Praise to God. God. That's powerful, yes. All right, here's Susan who lives in El Paso, Texas. She was in a serious auto accident, sustained a head injury. She was diagnosed with an auditory disorder uh, caused sounds to be distorted. One day she heard Terry pray saying someone has a hearing problem. It's a muffled sound. You're like you're in the hallway. And God's opening that for you right now. You'll hear crackling in your inner ear. And she heard the crackling, and her hearing was restored Praise instantly. God. That's wonderful. All right. I'm so happy for her. Well, let's pray. Mm -hmm. All right. Folks, wherever you are, uh, you heard the gentleman say, and I'll say it again, what Jesus said, hitherto you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. Ask and you shall receive. We want to pray for you right now. Father, with you all things are possible. We thank you for miracles. We see lives that are twisted and torn. We see those who are the result of sex trafficking. We see people who are hopeless and crying out to you. We see people like Pastor Brunson who's put in a jail, looks like a life sentence, and it seems to be no hope. 
and he cries out to you to take him away because it hurts so badly. But, oh, God, reach down into the hearts of those who are suffering and touch them in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Terry, what do you have? There's someone, you've, um, you've started to develop alopecia, and you're just so concerned about the loss of your hair. God is correcting that situation in your body, in your system right now. It's just all being set right according to His good purposes, and your hair will be restored. Somebody, you're losing bone support in your teeth. Your teeth are getting loose, and God is going to clean those roots and make those things absolutely whole. Right now, there's a miracle taking place inside your mouth. Mm. Fred, I believe this. You just put your hand on your mouth in the name of Jesus. Touch. Terry. Yes, and someone else, you have a shortness of breath. It's not just when you go up and down stairs, but just a little bit of walking even, and you're so worried about it. God's correcting that scenario for you right now. Take a deep breath. Just breathe in His healing power and exhale. It's gone now in Jesus' name. There's a, there's like a tumor on your right knee. Uh, there's, there's some sort of a growth coming out of your knee. I'm not exactly what it is or whether, uh, but just touch that knee in the name of Jesus. You're made whole. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. And amen. All right. All right. Well, we've got, we want you to know if you have a specific prayer need, you can call into yeah. our prayer center all the time, 1-800-700-7000. We're going to take a few minutes to answer some of the questions that you've sent in. This is a viewer, Pat, who says, I know that God's word says not to add or take away from what is already written. So is it okay for me to write in my Bible? Oh, of course it is. Everybody writes notes in their Bible. Thank There's you. nothing wrong with that. <laughs> uh, you're not adding to the word of God. You're not trying to rewrite the word. So the Bible is talking about those who actually take the Scripture and, and change them. Yes, and the meaning of them. Exactly. And there are people who are doing that, I might add, liberals who are trying to uh, put so-called form criticism on and re-change the Word. But you're just making notes in your Bible, there's nothing in the world wrong with that. Right. Okay, this is Daniel who says, what do I do if someone uses the name of God in vain? Say I'm in a chat group of a hundred people and someone uses the name of God as a swear word. Do I say something? Jesus said we're not of the world. So my first instinct is to just ignore them, even though it always infuriates me. I'm concerned that if I say something that it may be the wrong thing, which could actually make their attitude toward God worse. Am I right to keep quiet? Uh, it's a problem, isn't it? You know, I, I'll give you an example. I was playing golf. I'm not much of a golfer, but I was playing golf with a couple of fellows. Uh, one of them headed up Tiffany. Another one was a businessman or wealthy fellow from out in, in Ohio and Cleveland. And as this man from Cleveland hit a bad shot, he would just curse and say, oh, Jesus. And I finally looked at him. I said, you know, Jesus didn't cause that bad shot. You did. <laughs> <laughs> Take that. And, you know, he, he later told his friend, he said, that preacher did more for my cousin than anybody I've ever seen. <laughs> well, you know, it is a bad habit in people's yeah. lives. And sometimes my mom at Packer, we, they'd go to the Packer games and, you know, oh, people yeah. would start drinking in the game and she'd turn around and say, please don't talk about my Lord that way. They don't even think that, that it's of offensive to you. So. Well, I, I was reading a script and somebody wanted me to, you know, a possible script mm -hmm. for a movie. And there was this, People were saying, Jesus, Jesus, and I said, you know, what is this? Well, that's just the way they talk. Well, no, it shouldn't be. Do you ever say, oh, Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad? I mean, no. How oh, do you right. value your life? Yeah, all right, what else? <laughs> okay, this is Lorraine who says, do the Kurds own the oil that is on their land, or is it owned by another country, and they are just guardians? No, they own it. It's, it's in Kurdistan, and it's called Kirkuk, and... Uh, our dear president, I must say, is not aware, at least he wasn't, that, that they have this one of the biggest oil fields in the world. It's called Kirkuk. It's right in the middle of the uh, Kurdistan area. See that Kirkuk on the map? Well, that's part of Kurdistan, and uh, that, that's part of the, of the land that they own, and, and on their land is, is this fabulous oil field is producing about 500,000 barrels of oil a day. It may take up as much as 700,000. That's one of the biggest in the world. So it's, what's it's, happening there also threatens that. Oh, well, sure, the, 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 the people coming in would love to take it away from them, but 
Okay. This is Ethan, who says, why don't parents pay attention to their children anymore? You can go anywhere in public, a store, a restaurant, even the library, and the kids are running around screaming and doing things I would have been punished for, but the parents are oblivious. I feel like a grouchy old man, but I'm only 23. The children at church are so loud you can barely hear the pastor. What can be done without offending the parents? Wow. Well, I think you've got to talk to the parents and say, listen, you know, and the, and the pastor needs to do that. You know, the, you know, you got to control your children. And uh, but in a, in a restaurant, I've I've seen you're right. Little children running around, they're in danger. They danger the the servers. The servers could trip over them. I mean, it is the most thoughtless thing in the world. What do you say? I mean, how do you teach people to be thought to to, to be considerate of others? other people? Sure. Do unto others you'd have them do unto you. Okay. This is Jeannie who says, when we pray, by his stripes I am healed, I have a question regarding the word healed. It means physical healing, but can it also mean healing of relationships and reconciliation in families? Well, it can mean anything you want it to, but it does mean physical. I mean, he's talking about physical healing. By the stripes of Jesus, diseases have been healed. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what it means. Uh, uh, of course, the Lord's power extends to physical relationships, to all kinds of activity. The power of God is, is able to do all exceeding abundantly what we can ask or think. Of course, it's good for everything, but don't stretch the meaning beyond what it actually says in the Bible. Mm -hmm. We leave with our power minute from the book of James. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Tomorrow, a stunning decision with seconds to spare. Why one young woman hit a change of heart inside an abortion clinic. Well, that's all the time we've got. And thank you for being with us. For Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. We appreciate you. God bless you. We continue to pray for you. You pray for us. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.